Welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 139, and thank you so much for tuning in. Today, we've got something different on tap for you today, so stay tuned, see what it is. I'll tell you about it in just a moment. At Whistlekick, we make the world's best sparring gear. Here on Martial Arts Radio, we bring you the web's best podcast on the traditional martial arts twice a week. Welcome. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm the host of the show and also the founder at Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel. Thank you to the returning listeners, and welcome to those of you checking us out for the first time. Have you seen our sparring boots? They're lightweight, they're really comfortable, and we did away with that silly toe strap. Now you can keep your foot firmly planted on the floor, just like when you're not wearing sparring gear at all. Check them out today at whistlekick.com. If you want the show notes, you can find those at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Now, if you're not on the newsletter list, this is a great time to do it. We send out exclusive content, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests for the show. As a thank you for joining, we'll send you our top 10 tips from martial artists, an exclusive podcast episode. You can sign up for the newsletter on our website, and if you're listening to this when it comes out, you should, because we've still got some great holiday deals coming. And how do we let you know about those? You guessed it, on the newsletter. Today's episode's a little bit different. In fact, it's quite different. I picked up Master Brendan Goodall, who has already been on the show, and many of you have probably figured out by now as a close friend, because he comes up in conversation, and people tied to him have been on the show. In fact, he's my brother. It was Thanksgiving Day, and we decided that we would just chat about martial arts and record it for all of you. We were out and about in the car, and I brought the recording gear with me, so that's what we did. Came out great. I hope you enjoy it. So, um, to everyone listening, you will hear a difference in the audio quality because this is the first time we're recording in a car, a moving vehicle, and to do that completely unintentionally, but this is just the way it happened, we have back the very first person who was recorded not over Skype, Master Brennan Goodall from, what, what were you, episode 15? I was right after 11? Andy Campbell. Oh, he was nine, so you were 10. Yeah. You were episode 10. So we're back. This is going to be episode 140. And you are here back from episode 10. Um, I think we've only had like one other person. No, we've had two other people pop back on for topic shows. And that is what we are doing today. Um, There's some kind of fun personal reasons that we're together today. Master Goodall is getting married in two days. It's Thanksgiving. We're recording. I'm stealing him away for his bachelor party and what better way for two martial artists to pass the time as they drive somewhere than to talk about martial art martial arts and just record it for the sake of those seven of you that listen no it's more than that but it's fun to pretend that we're just talking and like nobody's listening so we were talking about what we wanted to talk about and why don't you start by saying the things that you were you were saying to me before that kind of led to how we got where we were going, topic-wise. All right, so basically one of the things that's been coming up for me a lot when I watch some of our students is a lot of the fundamentals aren't always there when they kick. Like, they all know which way they're supposed to point their knee. They all know they're supposed to pivot when they throw a turning kick or a side kick. But there's lots of little technical things that they don't seem to be picking up where like you're they don't use their whole body to generate power they don't necessarily pay attention to where their hands wind up they don't pay attention to where their heads wind up details yeah okay and i think one of the more important parts of being a black belt you know willingness to stick with it aside is attention to detail because you don't get a black belt by being sloppy in what you're doing. You get it by having crisp, clean techniques and an understanding of what you're doing and how your body's supposed to be moving. So, sure. I, I mean, I, I in the majority of schools that I've trained in and, and visited, a huge percentage of the material that one's expected to know for a black belt, if we take forms out, if we take out some of those, those complex patterns, it's all learned in the first couple of years. Yeah. So really the difference becomes your refinement, your ability to perform those movements at a higher standard, and that, that bar, in theory, keeps getting raised as you go along. 
Yeah, and one of the things I remember distinctly from being a colored belt all the way back in the early 90s was I did it until I got it right, and I wasn't allowed to move on to the next thing until I was at least competent at what I was doing for that night, and I had the expectation that I was going to continue to get better outside of class situations. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it almost feels like that doesn't happen quite as much anymore. Like, they're the... I think there are a lot of school owners out there that will prioritize keeping the kids in keeping students engaged because it, it it's their livelihood and and I am absolutely not saying that that is is wrong if teaching martial arts is your livelihood then you need to do what you can to keep your students engaged so that they will stick around otherwise you are no longer in business and then you aren't helping anyone you know even if, if we're looking at it selfishly from the perspective of keeping the martial arts going and keeping people educated so they continue to pass on martial arts it's critical that people are able to meet their financial needs and so keeping students around is core to that right so but I think where it can start to slide is when the method for engagement becomes false praise yeah because I think one of the things that came up when we were kind of deciding what to talk about was you see that higher quality of standard start to dip in subtle ways when the shift over towards things like participation trophies and things like that started arising where you didn't separate out not necessarily winners and losers for lack of a better term but the people who put the effort forward towards the people who didn't put as much effort forward because I'm not willing to say people aren't trying but some people try harder sometimes for sure and I think that we've seen um, a, a diluting of the value of rank in some schools. I don't want to get hate mail from people saying that I'm, I'm accusing your school of something. If your school throws rank around like it doesn't have a lot of value, you, you know that. I don't need to tell you that, and, and I'm not thinking of any schools in particular right now. I'm just, you know, we, we all know that some schools award rank easier than others, and whatever works is fine. If it works for you, if it keeps the, the students engaged, and if they continue to learn, then that's, then that's fine. But I think that there's a bare minimum where if you cross a line where students don't have to work, if they feel, if a student earns their rank at any point without feeling like, oh man, I'm glad that's over with, or I'm glad I got through that, or, you know, the, the, the challenge isn't there, then the rank doesn't have value, and I would guess, and I have no study to back this up, but I'm going to guess that in those schools there's more turnover, which in fact is the opposite of what those school owners are looking for because people don't value what they're earning. Yeah, I think one of the the things Master Oda used to say to me when I was a young child is fear is an excellent motivator. And I think once you remove the risk of consequence from your training that doesn't necessarily inspire people to take what they're doing to the next level and they don't become the people like me who take a step back every couple of months and be like what do I need to do differently so I can get better what do I need to understand more and what I'm doing so I can express it more to you people so everybody understands it and start formulating their own way to move and how to kick how to even key up. I mean, we talk on the show about martial arts being a method of personal development. And that strategy, the idea of using martial arts and the things that you learn as a martial artist to become a better person, that those tools shouldn't expire. And if people are passed up in rank 
quickly, and it's not even about rank. If people are given that false praise, I think that's probably the best term to use from the way I see it. Yeah, that makes sense. If that false praise is, is continu- continually thrown on people, then what are they really learning? Maybe they're learning some self-defense. Maybe they're learning self-esteem. But the world is not a shiny, happy place all of the time. Some would say it never is. And if you don't have strategies for life to cope with what's happening, which I think is in maybe not the goal of all martial arts schools, but I think it's a consequence of solid teaching, then I don't think that martial arts is being used to lift people up as much as it could be. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, I think one of the things I think about and part of what I'm doing right now is poor listening because I'm planning what I want to say next (laughs) and not necessarily ready to respond to what you're saying. That's okay. Sorry about that. Hey, it's all good. Is that I think if you want to be successful in martial arts and this kind of plays into a theme where a lot of your guests have said you need to get out there and train with all sorts of different people and find people who inspire you to get better. I was listening to Brandon Beninati's podcast earlier this week and that was one thing that really resonated with me. It's not necessarily that I need to hop schools and find different instructors to train under but seminars are a great way to inspire yourself to find something new it's always fun finding that person who makes you want to do better at tournaments because when you start doing better, everybody you train with will start rising to what you're doing and that keeps people motivated and it keeps people going. And it kind of leads me back around to something that I think about myself a lot is if you want to be successful in martial arts, you have to be willing to tinker with what you're doing. I, I like that word. In, in that context, tinker. I don't think I've ever thought of it in that way, but I think that that's a, a good a good word. Because when I think of tinkering, I think of trial and error. Yeah. I think of self experimentation. You know, kind of an informal thing. And it's definitely something that I do. You know, when I practice on my own, I'm thinking about you know certain biomechanical adjustments based on the things that I'm learning through my other physical practices, CrossFit and gymnastics bringing those back into martial arts and, and how they affect the body and things like that. And that, yeah, I'm definitely tinkering for sure. Well, I think when it comes to realizing that you always have to tinker to get better in martial arts is when you start thinking of it as a living, breathing organism. And it's kind of like physics in that way and that your core concepts are always there front kicks work good against turning kicks or roundhouse kicks just because straight's quicker than circular. Right. But there are always different ways to... Your body mechanics change as you get older, so how you throw something needs to follow that. And if you get into that habit at a young age when you can still be on the upswing from what you're learning, then that will easily help with as you come into the downside when you settle into maybe more of a teaching role or a less competitive situation than you would be five or ten years ago. I think the word that we're, I don't know if we're intentionally dancing around it, is boredom. Right? I think, you know, we're talking about motivation, we're talking about false praise, we're talking about how do you keep people engaged i.e. prevent them from getting bored. And I think that that's where a lot of that false praise is. You know, oh, this student is not seeming to be dedicated. I'm worried that they're going to leave or um, they're not progressing at the rate that I want them to. Maybe I can inspire them by complimenting them or promoting them or giving them something new to learn. And, you know, I. I'm the first one to to preface this by saying I'm not a parent, you know, so I can't quite say, hey, I 
you know, know what has worked with my children, but I know what has worked with the children I have taught. You know, I've, I've taught gymnastics for years. I've taught martial arts for even longer to, to people of all ages. And I know that I can always find something to compliment someone on. And it doesn't have to be this wide sweeping, hey, you're great. And, you know, promote them. It can be, you know, I really liked the third movement that you did there. It really looked like you were trying. You know, and for yeah. a lot of people, recognition of effort can be just as motivating, if not more so, than recognition of skill. Yeah, I mean, and I always kind of get worried when I say this because I could easily see it coming off as a backhanded compliment of, I really like the effort you put into stuff. It doesn't address how you throw the technique, but I can see that there's actual, you're trying, you're thinking, you're trying to understand what you're doing and that easily makes it apparent that you're someone who wants to be here. Right. And I think we can agree that, you know, obviously martial arts isn't just about skill. It's about effort. It's about that personal development piece. And for some people, certain things are going to come faster than others. But if you're, if you're trying, if you're putting in the time, the progress will come, you know, and everybody's progress is individualized and it should be. But that doesn't mean that we we don't value the progress. And it doesn't mean that we only value the effort or we don't value the effort, but we value both. And you got to find a balance that works. And it can and I think even should be slightly different in different schools. I agree with that. Um, I think an easy thing that would help in that situation once again I don't own a school I don't have children I'm very close to having a child but (laughs) yes I don't have my own right now is that if someone has shown that they're putting in more effort they're understanding their material for their rank quicker they shouldn't have to test with someone who isn't necessarily putting forth the effort that they are. I think it makes more sense to have people advance in rank up to a point because I don't... It twinges something in my brain when I hear 10-year-old black belts. But I think that you should progress in rank based on effort and how well you understand material versus it's time for you to test. Sure. I think the best thing that any teacher of anything can do is instill in their students that effort leads to success. If you want to get somewhere, you have to try, right? And it doesn't matter what it is you're trying, you're looking to do it's going to take a certain amount of effort. And if you grow up learning that, hey, if I want something, I have to work for it. And the more I want it, the more I'm willing to work for it, then I think the more success people can have. I've known plenty of students that saw early success, you know, through, you know, white belt, yellow belt, green, blue, whatever, you know, like through those low to moderate ranks, But then they end up in, you know, brown, red, somewhere in there. And their natural skill all of a sudden is not enough. You know, maybe they start really young and they're going through physical changes. They're they're going through puberty. So all of a sudden their body doesn't work quite the way they were used to or or whatever. But because they hadn't correlated the, the success that they had in martial arts with their effort, they didn't know what to do. You know, and I'm not going to mention any names, but there, there are people that I could mention right now that you would recognize their name. You go, oh, yeah, like, yes, yes, yes. You know, people that we've trained with that fade away because all of a sudden things get hard and because they didn't have those small stumbling blocks that occur at low ranks to work through, they bail. And I think the only way to avoid that, because you don't want to 
unnecessarily hold someone back, right? I mean, you're talking about just the opposite. Yeah. I think the only thing that, that you can do is to hone in on effort. You know, instead of just giving a, a generic compliment, but like, hey, good job, or that's a great kick or strike or whatever, I really like the effort you're putting in. I like this one more than that one because on this one you tried harder. You know, something that that correlates effort to success. Mm-hmm. No, yeah, I, I can say that out of like all the people my age that I started training with, by the time I got to the point where I was testing for red belt, black belt, I was the only one left out of that group and sometimes they find things that they enjoy more than martial arts but I stuck with it and they didn't so that obviously says something and plays into all those statistics about like every one out of a hundred people gets a black belt down the road but then just for the sake of argument I find myself getting bored a little bit and one thing that helped me was cutting back how often I train Mm -hmm. because it gives me more time to develop as more of an entire cohesive person which in turn had the added effect of by me not being there every night makes me not mind practicing makes me not mind working out on my own because it's not something I have to do on top of well, I wake up, I worked out, I went to work all day, right. probably worked late, went to class for three hours and come home and finally get around to doing my own stuff. Right. And, you know, we, we dance around this a little bit on the show. I, we, we've talked about it a couple of times, you know, the idea of higher rank martial artists getting bored. And and it happens. And, and, and I take time off from time to time for, for the very same reason that you're talking about. Not that I don't love martial arts not that I I stopped becoming a martial artist but sometimes when you've been doing something your entire life it's easy to take it for granted and sort of take a step back and say you know what I do still love this I do still want this to be part of my life you can step back in and and go hard again you know and really approach it and look at it with a different perspective and that's part of the reason that I train in multiple places with multiple instructors and I go to seminars because I like having those new viewpoints because it, you know, you've probably had a circumstance and I bet most of the listeners have too, where you learn something and it completely upends everything that you thought you knew about a subject, you know, martial arts or something else. And you go back and you're like, I've been doing this wrong all this time and you've got to redo reteach yourself or whatever all of your forms or you know the way you punch or something it's actually the reason I go back and I basically reinvent the wheel for myself because I always look at it from the perspective of if I was me teaching white belt me how would I want this explained and that's always been a good way for me to explain it to myself because thank you because if I can't explain something myself in a way that makes sense and trust me, I have some very odd ways of explaining things <laughs> myself. There's no way I'm going to be able to express that to someone I'm actually trying to teach something to. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think continuing to change your perspective is, is really valuable. I was One of the things I've been playing with in my head is the notion that when we start teaching kicking... And I'm sure there are schools out there that have come to the same conclusion I have, but most schools that teach how to kick start with a pretty complicated, you know, four or six step kick and that it requires balance and maybe they'll let them put a hand on the wall or a partner or something. And that works. But what if you asked someone to stomp? Everyone knows how to stomp. Okay, now bring your knee up higher and stomp. Well, now you've done a knee, you've done half of a kick, a front kick. And then what if you say, okay, bring your knee up and then stomp out to the side. So the knee comes up at the front, you're stomping out to the side. That's half of a side kick. 
yeah. the way most people teach it. Stomp and put your foot down behind you. That's a back kick. And you can use those those fundamentals. And so for me, like as I've gone back and I've thought about my own kicking, I mean, I don't stomp as I walk, but I step. Yeah. And if I can correlate my kicks back to stepping, right? So that that's an example for me where just in the last couple months, I've started looking things, looking at things a little differently. Yeah, I mean, just keeping it on the subject of kicking, my instructor, Master Jordan, has a great way of explaining kick concepts where every kick's easy because my leg can only hinge and I can only stomp up and down and every kick follows those motions. Mm. Turning kicks follow that motion with hinging, groin kicks follow that motion, hooking kicks follow that same hinging kick motion. Mm -hmm. and front kicks and side kicks are all stomping motions it's just learning how to aim where you're kicking that's probably the trickiest part and knowing where everything about your body has to be right and but of course that's practice yeah and, and that kind of brings it full circle exactly that brings us back to repetition of you can't move on to technique b until you understand technique a because technique a has a very integral part in understanding how you do technique B right and I think A I was a very spazzy out of the way child but one of the things I learned is you can teach attention span I learned it through doing lots of push-ups if I wasn't listening I learned it through the entire class having to do lots Me of push-ups if I wasn't listening for sure and as I grew up in rank and that love of martial arts flowered and grew, I realized that I could spend an entire class working on how to throw a sidekick as long as you kept... You can keep me interested on one thing as long as you're make, making sure you explain it well and you have interesting drills that inspire you to want to work. Right. And, and that's just it. It's, you know, there needs to be some context. I think that that's probably the best way that I think of it when I'm working with people, especially with kids, it can be as simple as having them face a different direction. Yeah. You know, we've talked about different drills on the show before, and, and I, one of the episodes is kind of in the list of episodes that we'll do someday, and, you know, don't forget if you're out there listening, you know, we're always open to suggestions, is on basic drills. You know, just throwing out some of those ideas, those things that, I've come up with that have worked for me as I'm teaching and I've taken groups of kids that because usually wherever I show up instructors want me teaching kicking because I guess that's my forte and I'm totally cool with that I love kicking I love teaching kicking so I show up and they're saying you know let's can, can you work with them on sidekicks because I have some unique maybe not unique some different drills for side kicks and for roundhouse round turning whatever you call them kicks that most instructors don't and I can keep those kids engaged for 30 plus minutes and enjoying their time by giving them some context and it can be everything from visualizations of you know who are you kicking what are you kicking you know getting them to actually see like there's a there's some kind of bad cartoon character, you know, if I'm working yeah. with younger kids or, um, you know, a bully in your school, if maybe they're a little bit older, changing direction. I mean, just little stuff like that and also conveying a lot of energy, you know, yeah. you, you've seen me teach and you've seen me have no voice at the end of one hour class because I'm, I'm not yelling at the kids. I'm yelling with the kids, right? I'm, I'm just... I have really high energy when I teach, and it tends to keep kids engaged. If you're bored, they're going to be bored. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Passion carries over to everything that you do. And if you're passionate about something, I, you can take somebody who's completely uninterested in the subject matter, and by the end of the time, if you maintain your enthusiasm, you can get somebody excited about something they wouldn't give a crap about 90 minutes earlier. And I think that that carries over to academics. I mean, not yeah. everyone's had uh, a number of martial arts teachers, but I'm sure everybody that's listening to this has had a number of academic teachers. And when you think about the classes that you liked, 
it wasn't always the subjects that you preferred because the teacher mattered. I mean, I, I grew up, as one might imagine, a math science nerd. I mean, that was that was my jam. But I hated most of my science classes because I had, tended to have terrible science teachers through high school. In, excuse me, in junior high and in elementary school, I had great science teachers. In high school, I had, my math teachers were kind of mixed. I had, I had yeah. two that were great, two that were not so great. No, that's definitely true. As someone who wound up loving science starting freshman year because I had the most amazing science teacher I never lost that because I had at least decent teachers enough to keep my interest in the subject matter peaked until I could go on to a teacher who was just as amped about something as I was but I had a love-hate relationship with math every year because it depended on frankly, how old the teacher was because a lot of time tenured teachers don't care about what they're teaching anymore. Right. right. And, you know, I, there, there are some, some folks out there that, that might be listening and, you know, I, I know I've spoken with people like this that will say, you know, if, if they don't want to put in the work, if the students don't want to put in the work, they shouldn't be there. And, yeah, you could say that, but... I feel like if you're going to take on the responsibility, because it is a responsibility. We did a whole episode on privileges and responsibilities. Yeah. Teaching martial arts is is a privilege and a responsibility. And if you're going to do it, you owe it to yourself and to your students to put a lot of effort into it, to enjoy it. If you don't like teaching martial arts, you shouldn't be a martial arts teacher. Absolutely. And, and, if, and if you can't give it your all, you shouldn't. Um, you know, you you and I didn't know each other at this time, but ironically, it was the, the thing that led to us getting to know each other. When I first moved to Vermont out of college, I opened my own school. I had it for two years, and I think I've talked about this a little bit on the show. But at the same time, about a year in, I was really working hard trying to build my day job. You know, I, I was building an IT company, and at the end of a day, you know, I was only teaching four hours a week. It was is five uh, two kids classes two adult classes a week I think the adult classes might have been 90 minutes I forget I didn't have anything left you know I was getting up at five six in the morning putting in you know a 10 hour day sometimes four and then going to teach my students and I realized that I wasn't doing them justice I wasn't able to give them 100% but out of loyalty they, they were sticking around and I, I saw the degradation of what I was able to offer them. So I gave them a little bit of notice, not much, because I was spent, and I turned them loose. I said, I cannot give you what you deserve, and I encourage you to go out into the world and find someone else who can. And most of them did. They did go and they did train with some other people, um, and that's great. And, yeah. and you know they had that opportunity because I was self-aware that I had just turned into a crummy teacher. Yeah, no, um, definitely. And it's been one of the more evolved reasons I've given about why I'm a, either A, not ready to open my own school or I don't want to. I'm comfortable working within the system I'm in right now because it gives me the freedom to teach. It gives me the freedom to express how I want to express what I'm saying but I'm also going to point out I curriculum like a madman for someone who doesn't have his own school and I come up with ideas I come up with things I can do and I get a chance to play with some of those but I couldn't open a school and keep my day job at the same time because I'd want to dive in head first and I think that's the way I'd have to do it of I just open a school and that becomes what I do with my life. Right. And you, you, you know, the setup that you have now is, is the same one I have. You get to teach pretty much when you want to. Yeah. But without the responsibility of having to teach all the time, so you can go 100%, you can go hard at it when you're ready, when you're able. Yeah. And the people learning from you are better off for it, and the other instructors, you know, 
can can look at you and and pull the good things and they can be inspired too. You know, one of the deep dark secrets that I've learned from conducting this show because there's stuff that goes on before and after that never makes it to air and, and it's all recorded and and I'm sure, well, maybe, I hope someday when I die um, and and because I'm going to assume at the point that I pass on uh, most of these other higher rank folks that are quite a bit older than me. I mean, you're not older than me and you've been on the show now twice, but yeah. <laughs> 50 years from now, no, wait, more than that, whatever. <laughs> Someday all these recordings may make it to light. And uh, bicentennial anniversary of Whistlekick Whistle Martial Arts Radio. There you go. There, there you go. Uh, Whistlekick Space Martial Arts Universe Space Interplanetary Systems. Live from the Whistlekick Space Station where right. on martial arts is trained Pluto. in zero gravity now. Right. Um, yeah, it gets a little weird here, folks. I apologize. Uh, this is what happens when the two of us get together. Yep. But... What was I talking about? Oh, so... <laughs> The deep dark secret that I talk to these folks about is that they get bored teaching. Think of the things that you have done in your life for 20 years, 30 years, 50 years. You have periods of boredom. And yes, we have had folks come on the show and they have said that they get up and they train and they love to train every single day. And I applaud those folks. And they are incredible martial arts and incredible people who have found their true calling. That is the exception and not the rule. And the re- only reason I bring that up is, is well, really twofold. For people that are training, for students of martial arts that are listening, that have those days, those moments where they're thinking, you know, I don't feel like coming to class today. Is there something wrong with me? Should I stop training because I don't love it every moment of every day? No. If you're an instructor and you're thinking, oh, you know, I'm going to kick one of these kids in the face today. Doesn't mean you should stop teaching. It does mean that you've got to consider taking a break. And that's one thing that a lot of small martial arts schools do not have the opportunity or they don't see that they have the opportunity for is shutting down classes you know, for a week or two at a time so they can take a break, but it's necessary. Heck, I know plenty of people that have been out for surgery or for seminar tours or whatever, and they get guest instructors to come in and run their classes. And the students love it, and they come back, and and the students are fired up, and they just learn a bunch of new stuff, and everybody's better off for it, and there's nothing wrong with that. But don't look poorly upon yourself if you're feeling like you're not fired up 100% of the time yeah no um, I remember back when I was a teenager Master Rhoda had a heart attack and as his senior student there at the time I wound up running his school and I think that kind of soured my taste of teaching a little bit because I didn't know what I was doing but But you did great I remember I had a lot of help yep And I think that was an important thing, too. And it's one of the things I really appreciate about Master Jordan is that he's willing to go on those vacations because he knows he has such a successful and talented group of master instructors who can cover for him when he needs it. I love taking classes with Master Lombardo. I love taking classes with Master Forsberg. And I love it on those nights when... I get thrown into the mix because I get to play and I get to give people a different perspective. Mm -hmm. And for all the similarities between the three of us, just because of years in martial arts, we all process things different ways and we all have different things we like to work on. There's a common theme of we're all going to let you understand what it was like when we were your rank, but past that, we all develop lessons differently and that keeps it interesting for students and I love Master Jordan for the fact that he gives us the opportunity to do that and I think that's really important for students to hear different things in different ways because different people learn differently and to hear something 17 different times from 17 different people 17 different ways 
means one of them's probably going to sink in. You know, one of the things that, that frustrates me when I, when I talk to teachers of any subject, oh, this kid isn't getting it, then you're not teaching it right. That's something I've said myself, like, if you need more energy in class, you don't change out the students as much as I'd like that to happen every once in a while, because I'm a very happy-go-lucky guy, but I don't like everybody. And that's but, okay. Exactly. But if you're not reaching them, don't get a bigger hammer, get a different tool. Yeah. Doesn't mean that there aren't going to be students that just don't click with you. There, there are. There are... There are kids, and you know what? We're, we're gonna we're gonna shift into my, my gymnastics instruction because this, this catalyzed finally yesterday in my brain. So there's a kid. I've been coaching gymnastics for four years. There's a child that was part of my first group, drove me insane. Um, this kid would fake injuries. Uh, he didn't want to be there. He was seven. His mom. I don't know if she forced him or dragged him or whatever. Uh, he went to get a drink one day and just didn't come back. And I looked up and he was gone. I mean, just... And I dealt with this stuff for for two years. There were days that I could feel the energy level of the class drop, like, through the floor as soon as he walked out and the rest of the kids saw him because they drove him nuts, too. Mm. But I kept trying. I kept working with him. I didn't engage with him on, you know, his failings. I just made sure that what he was doing did not negatively affect the rest of the group. And if it did, I made him sit down. Finally, over the last three weeks, this kid has started to do movements that the rest of the class, most of the rest of the class cannot do. Kids that are overall better than him have tr- have been training longer than him are more athletic than him he successfully completed his first forward handspring yesterday and if anyone out there has a gymnastics background uh, yes that is a fundamental skill but these kids train 90 minutes a week we don't run summers we don't run vacations so it's not a ton of training time and we spend most of our time jumping on trampolines because it's fun oh, absolutely uh, this is this is not a competitive team but what that made me realize just over the last few weeks was I have been getting through to this, excuse me, to this kid all this time. It was just such a slow amount of progress every week that I couldn't see it. But finally something turned in him and I started seeing that a year ago, but the physical application wasn't there. He just seemed to be a little bit more engaged. He seemed to try a little bit harder. And I would point that out and say, you know, I loved your energy today. You know, stuff like that. And now, yesterday, because we, we had class yesterday, I could not get this kid to leave. He, can I try one more time? He was working on trying to, to get a front flip in, in kind of a, a complicated scenario coming off a trampoline. All right, one more time. And he didn't get it. Oh, can I do it one more time? This kid, seriously, used to walk out if he didn't want to be there. Yeah. So, could somebody else have gotten through to him better? Maybe. I think a lot of times proximity has a lot to do with getting kids who don't like it and having them stay even though they obviously don't want to be there. Because, I mean, I'm from a small town in Vermont. If I found out Taekwondo wasn't what I wanted to do, I didn't have a lot of other options to go explore. I mean, yeah, I played soccer, yeah, I played basketball, very poorly but I did play basketball was I obviously need something to do the fact that it's not something I really want to try is kind of a problem that's unsolvable unless my parents are willing to take me an hour and a half to go try something different right but eventually catching the carrot every once in a while that you always dangle in front of people's faces it doesn't it amazing thing for self-confidence and like oh I did a front walk over today that's pretty good I didn't fall on my face I didn't hurt my wrists I that's brought to you by I tried to teach myself to do a handspring one summer so I could learn a flip throw for soccer (laughs) it never went well 
I did one of those once. I tried it once. I completed it once, and it scared the crud out of me. Never did it again. Oh, absolutely. That ball went far. I tried it with a ball once because I kind of got to the point where I could do a handspring, but I landed on my head. Yeah. On the ball. Ow. It was pretty cool to watch, actually. At least that's what people told me. <laughs> but, yeah, back to, you know, on-topic discussions. Yeah, topic. Right? I think it's important to realize that there's a way to reach every kid. Sometimes it's not your job to reach them. Some Say that again. I feel like that was really poignant. I want to hear that again. Um... There's a way to reach every kid, but it's not always your job to reach them. I mean, sometimes personalities don't mesh. Sometimes it's something they really don't want to do. Sometimes it's, let's say I started in Taekwondo, which I did. Let's say I just couldn't stand it. I couldn't stand the people I was around. I couldn't stand what I was being taught. But at some point, I got an opportunity to try let's just go for the opposite end of the spectrum. I got to try a kendo class. Yeah. And that was just that moment when the light bulb clicked above my head, the heavenly light waved down around me. And I was like, I need to do this. Right. And that's nothing against Taekwondo. That's nothing against karate. That's nothing against whoever was trying to teach this person. But sometimes you can't reach somebody and you need to be willing to say why don't you try this you have my blessing I'd love it if you came back at some point but I think for someone to truly become passionate about martial arts it requires the intersection of the student and the teacher getting along the the, the teacher being passionate about the style that they're teaching and the way that they're teaching it and that style and system working and, and clicking for the student like that's a lot of variables yeah especially if you're dealing with a four or five year old right so at that point what becomes most important it's the relationship mm-hmm. it's is that instructor or are is one of the instructors is one of the are one of the is somebody at that school clicking with that kid, that student, whether it's a child or an adult? And I think we all know that. How we know how important that is. If you don't, if if something is not resonating for the student, then they're out. So we come back to it's the responsibility of the instructor to put forth the effort. And going back round to that sort of portion of the conversation I think it's very important for instructors to trust in what they're teaching and that if they lose one student there is a very high probability that they're going to get two back and these two students will lead to more students and eventually it'll grow to a point where you're like I could use less students I'm pulling myself in three different directions sure. but when I, when I think about the schools that I visit the largest schools have the most exciting dynamic instructors. That that is the that is the, the difference that I see. Yes. Small schools generally, you know, because there's always exceptions. Small schools tend to have less dynamic instructors. Yeah. If you're an instructor and you want to have a larger, more successful school, if that's important to you then work on yourself. Be Become to more dynamic, more exciting. Be what? Be willing to tinker. Be willing to tinker. Take a couple of your, your higher ranks. I was talking on the phone with, I, I think he listens to this show. I'm not going to, I don't know that I want to say his name just because we didn't talk about that I would do that, but uh, someone who has been on the show, uh, who is Whistle Kick's largest wholesale customer, we were chatting on the phone a couple weeks ago. We actually turned into like a two-hour uh, marketing class. We were talking about marketing stuff for his school and, and some of the things that I was suggesting just based on my travels that might work for him. And one of the things that he was doing that I really loved 
is that he has constructed a, I forget what he called it, but other schools call it a leadership team. You know, a group of higher ranked students, not necessarily all the same rank or the highest ranks, but people that are willing to take a role in helping the school grow and operate. And so he takes those students and sits down with them, you know, once a month or so, and they talk about not just how the school can grow, but how he as the owner, as the head instructor can get better. He trusts them enough and he's humble enough to ask his students how he can become a better instructor. Wow. That's not something I ever expected to hear. Like I've heard of leadership teams and I love what they do because it allows those students who want to be teachers the opportunity to actively get out there and pursue what they think could be their passion. And that's great. If we, we're at a point, maybe, I don't know if it's a point in time or if, or if humanity has always craved this, but the knowledge that the people that we look up to are real and fallible, it makes them more approachable. Social media has done a great job of showing us the behind the scenes of people that, you know, 10, 20 years ago, we would only see very polished versions of. And some of these lesser known stars have become big stars. Why do people like watching reality TV? Not because it's really real, but because we see the, the rough spots. We see the unpolished, non airbrushed versions of some of these people that have money and fame and, and, and some of the things that a lot of us want. And it allows us to see ourselves as more similar to them. It's fun to humanize people that you put on the pedestal, like keeping it on reality shows. I was addicted to Snoop Dogg's e reality show for a very long time because I love Snoop Dogg and seeing his family life was interesting to me, right. realizing he's a normal person. So if we take that over to martial arts instructors and this gentleman that I was speaking of, no, he's not standing up in front of his class and saying, I have a survey box over there by the door. Please fill out, you know, these surveys of how much you hate me. Uh, you can circle how good of a job I'm doing from one to ten. No, it's not. He's not being that open. That would be the equivalent of and, reading internet comments about yourself, right? And I don't know that um, I would ever recommend that for for an instructor to to be that open about criticism because I think there's a um, I just realized I had my hand over the microphone. My apologies. Um, I, I think I was scratching my neck. I need to shave. Um, I think there's a um, a level of self-deprecation that can come from putting it in that way. But with this gentleman, it was a limited group. Um, his wife was in this group. You know, students that have been with him for years. And sitting down and having a constructive conversation about how can we improve. Because they've taken, they've not ownership in the sense that they own the school, but they've taken a level of responsibility for what goes on and they're interested. And it's, from a leadership team's perspective, it's fun saying, like, that's my student out there. That's him going out there winning first place. Because I know yeah. that I've been claimed by people before and I've claimed people myself. Yes. <laughs> You find people that you really resonate with, and there was one person, I don't know if I talked about him in my first appearance on the podcast, named Paul Mazuko, who I could feel him looking at me. We were so copacetic with what we were doing, and I'd fix what was wrong mm. that I didn't notice was happening, because I knew that he'd tell me at one point, and we haven't lost that relationship, even though he moved away, I can still feel him looking at me and I fixed something. <laughs> That's cool. But having a leadership team gives kids and even adults more opportunity to find those people in their life that are really going to help them get better. Yeah. So I think we're in a good place to stop. I think we've, we've talked about some good stuff today on, on 
this episode of Riding in Cars with Martial Artists. <laughs> with your host, Jerry Seinfeld. <laughs> Shout out to Seinfeld. <laughs> Did you see the episode with him and President Obama? No. They, um, I've only seen a couple episodes of that show. Um, and for folks that don't know what we're talking about, it has nothing to do with martial arts, but it's Jerry Seinfeld, the comedian, and he picks up other comedians and rides around in the car with them. But he did an episode where he picked up President Obama, but they wouldn't let him leave the safety of the White House. So he just drove <laughs> around the White House driveway with President Obama for like a half hour. <laughs> That's awesome. It was, it was a lot of fun. Um, so things that we've talked about, it is okay to be bored. Find a way to not be bored. It all comes back to passion and feeling engaged and putting in some effort and some energy and that you're the people that you're working with your instructor your students like they're gonna feel that you know if you're a student at a class and the energy level is just tanked and the instructors dragging too hey I guarantee you turn it up they're gonna feel it and you can bring the whole class up if you try hard enough and if you've been training a while that should be part of your training all right that's a tangent pulling it back other things we talked about were some of the things you talked about. We're trying um, to summarize here. Okay. You need to be willing to tinker with what you're doing. You need to be yeah. willing to make the changes to make whatever martial art you're practicing comfortable with yourself. It's okay to admit that I'm not the right person to reach a student all the time. Yep. And you need to trust in your teaching abilities enough that if you do lose a student you're going to get them back twofold and exponentially grow your school from there yep so cool all right um i, I did actually think of one more thing to say that's say it do very it. important for senior level martial artists people who have a master grandmaster in front of their name it's very important for you to take the time to still train yourself and Find opportunities, find seminars, find classes where you can just not be, I'll use myself here, I don't have to be Master Goodall, I can go to a school and be Brendan for a night, and learn something and not feel compelled to, hey, why don't you try it this way? I don't need to feel compelled to teach, I just need right. to be there to learn. Yeah. So find those opportunities for yourself and I think it'll help revitalize if you're feeling bored or you're feeling the two o'clock drag, if you so this will be the outro I'm not going to record a separate outro I probably put an intro in front of this um, I don't know yet because we're still doing the content but if you've been listening to the show and you haven't left us a review please do so get on over to iTunes there's also places on Stitcher and if you just search for podcast reviews there's a bunch of sites that you can leave reviews and because we have funky custom Google search alerts they will let us know pretty much any time you leave a review on any of those sites. Do it, and we will reach out to you. Actually, we're going to mention you on the show. You can reach out to us, and then we're going to send you some free stuff, like a shirt and whatever, uh, completely free, just as a thank you, because those reviews help the show grow. You can find show notes and other episodes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can find all the stuff that we sell at whistlekick.com, and if you're listening to this as it comes out, it is... Cyber Monday and if you're not on the newsletter list get on the newsletter list because we've got some special deals coming all through the holiday shopping season and we're going to want to check those out but until next time train hard smile don't get in any car accidents and have a great day <laughs>